Hello, and welcome back to Fundamentals of People Management, Module 8. I'm Dr. Lon Schiffbauer, and today we are talking about team building and collaboration. Now, this is an important topic because by its very definition, an organization is a collection of people brought together so that they can accomplish things that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do on their own. This means that the ability to bring together and lead a performing team, this isn't just nice to have soft skills. This is the backbone of an organization. However, I don't need to tell you that this is not to say that it is easy. Anytime we bring people together to work and to collaborate on a team, there's the potential. No, strike that. There is the absolute probability of conflict. Now, conflict is such an important topic that we are going to talk about it in a future module, the next module, in fact. Nevertheless, understand that this is going to happen. It's, it's part of the package. There is also the strong probability of some level of bureaucratic sludge getting in the way of doing the work. You know, there's this saying that, what is it, faster alone, further together? Well, okay, we can go faster alone because there's no bureaucratic sludge. But that's not how we work. That is not the intent of an organization. We want to come together and do incredible things as a team. But this means slowing up decision making and playing politics and kind of group think getting in the way and bureaucratic inertia starting to lead the objective rather than the objective itself. This is another thing that can get in the way of a strong performing team. So you can see there's a lot of potential for things to get in the way of a performing team. In fact, it's not even a potential. Like I said, this is an absolute certainty. So let's take a moment and do somewhat of a deep dive into some of the primary barriers that you're going to run into as you lead your team. The first one I want to bring up is conformity and groupthink. As it says here, this is when team members act in passive coordination or agreement with the rest of the group as part of a desire to avoid conflict or rejection by those pushing the agenda in question. As a social species, we have a strong incentive to get along with people, to be part of the team, to be included in the collective. As a result, we often kind of stray into groupthink. We don't push back where we should. We don't question where we should. And we start to, well, turn off our, our cognitive resources, turn off our ability to think critically about a question. This is something that happens quite often, something we want to avoid. The next one is status. The formal position or informal status held by those in the group can influence how individual members contribute. Even if the big leader in the room comes in and says, hey, you know what? There's no hierarchy in this room. During this brainstorming session, all ideas are equal. I want everyone to speak up. Yeah, that's not necessarily going to happen. Status, even if somebody in the position of higher status says, I'm not in higher status, that status rules the room. In the same way, if, if there's a junior person in the room who's coming up with ideas and so forth, there's a strong likelihood that others in the room will be kind of like, yeah, well, okay, you've, you're new here. You know, as soon as you figure out how things are going, then you'll see why that wouldn't necessarily work. This is an ongoing perennial problem with many teams. The next thing you want to be aware of is the existence of personal agendas. They're out there. It's, it's just the nature of the beast. These are the secret ambitions, hopes, desires, and assumptions that individual members don't want to share with the rest of the group. But these agendas, they're sort of driving the individual's contribution to the team. Many people want more status. They want more influence. They want to drive the direction of the decision eventually. They want to reduce the amount of work they have to do 
do. They want to increase the amount of work they have to do. All of these and many more are examples of personal agendas that will drive color and influence how they contribute in the team. The next one I want to call out is the lack of trust that exists in many teams, especially during the forming stage when we're first coming together. When team members do not trust each other, communication and collaboration is practically non-existent. And so you're not really getting the benefits of having people in a team when there is no trust between the team members. Okay, so this is just a taste of the many obstacles and barriers that can stand between you and a collaborative team. So now let's take a moment and really talk about how we form this team, understanding that these are the barriers we want to mitigate, avoid, or overcome. To do this, I want to share with you the five elements of forming a collaborative team. The first one is communication. By the way, as an aside, about the first answer to any problem in people management is communication. Communication is really the key to making sure that our agendas are aligned, that we know what our objective is, that we can build this relationship of trust, that we really know how to contribute and receive contributions in a meaningful way. So what does communication include? Well, it certainly includes contributing, no doubt about it, but it also includes listening. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. What does listening look like? Remember, to listen is a verb, therefore, it should be an observable action. What does the act of listening look like? We're talking about asking clarifying questions. We're talking about mirroring. We're talking about all kinds of techniques we can use to better understand what the person is saying. So you want to encourage both contribution and listening in your team. Communication also means discussing and debating, playing with the ideas, critically examining them, poking at them, interrogating them, seeing which ones really hold up and which ones need to be further tweaked and amended. We're not talking about simple confrontation in your face here. We're talking about sticking to the facts and really making sure that the best ideas and courses of action are the ones that we adopt and pursue. Now, one of the reasons we do all this is we really want to develop a shared understanding, a shared understanding of things like the objective, the problem statement, the options before us, the pros and cons of all of these options, the implications of any given decision. It's by having this shared understanding that we can get people on board and create a shared ownership of the problem and the solution and implementing that solution. It's by doing all these things that we can build trusting collaborative relationships. And this is what we absolutely need in a performing team. The second element of putting together a performing team is engagement. It's important that everybody in the team fully commit to contributing their skills and talents to reaching the objective. The reason they're on the team is because they have something to contribute. And if they're withholding, then it reduces the probability of team success. So we don't want any withholding. We want engagement. Now, this includes tactical things like attend the meetings, pay attention, listen, as we talked about with communication, contribute, speak up, brainstorm, do so in good faith, things of this nature. It also means being willing to take on roles and responsibilities. Now, in these meetings, when we're engaging, there's a lot of talk. But at the end of the meeting, we need people willing to take on the action items. So being willing to run point on something, to deliver something, to follow up on something, to research something, all of these things need to be done. And by being willing to actually do the work, your team members are demonstrating full engagement. The third element of forming a performing team is managing conflict. Now, as I mentioned earlier, managing conflict is such an important element that we're dedicating a whole module to it after this module. Nevertheless, I want to touch upon it here. 
Now, it's important to point out that we're talking about managing conflict, not avoiding conflict. Conflict, like fire, can either be good or bad. It just depends on how we manage it. Now, what do I mean by good conflict? Well, this is how we come up with the best ideas, the best solutions. We interrogate ideas. We challenge solutions. We go through the pros and cons. We practice constructive confrontation. This is how the best ideas and the best solutions percolate to the top. Now, to do this, it's important that we stay focused on the objective. We're not questioning one another's intent or agendas or anything or getting personal, stuff like that. We are simply focusing on the problem at hand. And this can be really effective. If we treat one another with respect and listen actively and develop those relationships and bonds of trust, then it doesn't feel like conflict. It just really feels like getting the work done. And rather than awful and horrifying, it's exciting and exhilarating. The next one, which we kind of alluded to earlier, is developing a shared understanding. For a team to be effective, there needs to be a shared common understanding of what we're actually trying to do. This is especially true when it comes to understanding what the goals and objective of the team are. What are we trying to accomplish? What does success look like? Now, this will inevitably require a certain amount of negotiation and discussion so that we can really come to a consensus of what we're trying to accomplish. It also means that as we go about doing these things, we exercise a tolerance for ambiguity. We're not going to always have all of the information. In fact, you will never have all of the information. There will be known unknowns and there will be unknown unknowns. And that's just the way it is. There's nothing we can do about that. Nevertheless, we need to come to a shared understanding of what we're driving toward and how we are going to navigate the ambiguities of the project. Finally, the fifth element of bringing together a performing team is establishing accountability. This means holding both ourselves and others accountable to the objectives that we set for this team. Remember, I said earlier that engagement means that people need to be willing to take on roles and responsibilities to get the work done. There needs to be accountability held to those roles and responsibilities. As you'll remember from an earlier module, we discussed how to be successful, an employee needs responsibility, authority, and accountability. When it comes to working as a team, this is all the more relevant. Accountability helps to establish and maintain those bonds of trust, the bonds of trust that are so vital to the success of the team. And it also helps make sure that we actually hit our marks, that we hit our milestones, that we achieve the outcome we're striving for. And as we discussed in our module on motivation, Achieving things, accomplishing things can be a strong driver, a strong motivator in our careers. So accountability is an important aspect of teamwork. So there's our quick overview about bringing people together into performing teams. But as I've mentioned a few times, a key element of this is managing conflict. And that's what we're going to talk about in our next module. So stick around and let's figure out how to help our people work through conflict. All right. Hey, thanks for joining. And until we talk again, have a fantastic day.